Hello, and thank you for listening to today's webinar, How to Reduce Forklift-Related Injuries with Autonomous Robots. My name is Lisa Shaw, and I'll be your moderator. I work on the marketing team at SIC, and I'm excited to be hosting today's session. I'm also pleased to introduce today's speakers, Stefan Neusser from Fetch Robotics and Alex Gilbom from SIC. Stefan is the Vice President of Products at Fetch Robotics, overseeing product strategy for all stretch robot, robots and solutions. Before joining Fetch, he was senior product manager at Google. And prior to that, Stefan served as CEO of collaborative robot startup Redwood Robotics and executive director of solutions at robotics incubator Willow Garage. Alex is the West Coast account manager for transport logistics at SIC. He is a sales professional with a broad experience in LiDAR, vision, and proximity sensors and has been with SICK for over five years. In this webinar, you'll learn how Fetch AMRs equipped with SICK sensors can safely navigate among humans and other industrial equipment, how to improve safety and reduce fort lift related injuries, and so much more. Alex and Stefan, please take it away. Thank you, Lisa. Um, hello, everyone. Good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, um, wherever you may be. Um, so, so many, many warehouse operators and people running factories have been looking at autonomous mobile robots to um, increasingly handle workloads that are traditionally done by forklift and that makes these processes safer and a lot of that safety comes um, to, to a large extent from new sensor technologies um, such as such as the laser scanners we use on our robots so in this session we want to look at what kind of workflows are our customers um, tackling with amrs and we want to take a closer look at the sensor technologies that we use in our AMRs um, to make these processes safe. Um, I really appreciate the introduction, Lisa. Um, I, I'm very excited to be here. I've been around collaborative robots for, um, for almost 10 years now, working for, for Google, for Willow Garage, um, for my own company, Red Hat Robotics, and now with Fetch. And um, I'm thrilled to be hosting this session together with Alex. Um, Alex, do you want to say a few more words about yourself before we dive into it? Oh, I'm very pleased to be part of this webinar also. Um, the opportunity to work with Fetch is uh, something SICK looked forward to for, for years. And um, the last couple of years that I've been able to uh, be the account manager at, at Fetch have been very exciting. I look forward to what else we can do together. Excellent. Thank you, Alex. Um, so what, what we're going to talk about here is, is generally applicable to, to to different types of AMRs, right? So AMRs, autonomous mobile robots, like the one that you see in the picture. We're gonna be using the fetch robots, which use um, six sensors as the example. So I wanna spend a couple of minutes introducing fetch and, and sort of the fleet of AMRs that we have. Um, fetch is a, a collaborative robotics companies, a company that is focused on the manufacturing and um, supply chain space. We're based in, uh, in, in, in Silicon Valley, in San Jose, California. Um, we robots in, in, in over 22 countries. Some of our customers run very sizable fleets, um, having robots working in real life um, production UK um, for several years. Um, I think of Fetch as, as a thought leader. We have um, a very, very close relationship with the ROS community. ROS is the open source um, robotic middleware layer that we use that, would have, that was originally created by um, Bill Garage. Willow Garage is a company that started 10 years ago. Um, you can think of it, if you're not familiar with Willow, as sort of the Bell Labs of collaborative robotics. Um, Melanie Weiss, um, Fetch's CEO, who you see here on the, on, on the slide, um, was a, a founding member of Willow Garage, and she sort of built up and run the robotics group there. Um, I myself worked at Willow Garage for a couple of years. So, so we've been around ROS, we've been around the collaborative ro robotics community for, for many years. We, on, FET, on the FETCH side, we actually also built a research robot that is used by many, many universities to um, continue to refine ROS. We're contributing back to that community. So as a company, I think of us as sort of having one foot in the research community and sort of one very strong foot in the um, product um, and, and sort of AMR um, as a product community. Now, let me also introduce you to the, the, the fleet. Um, so what you see here is the um, fetch robots that um, that we currently have available. As you can tell, um, there's there's really only three different bases um, of robots 
three fundamental different architectures here that you can see. There is um, the smaller around robot, the Freight 100, that you see here in different configurations. There is a model that has a, a shelf on top, a model that moves, around, a model that has a piece of conveyor, and then another model um, that is using RFID antennas for automated inventorization tasks. All of those robots are built on the same base, the, the round base um, that we call the Freight 100 base. And it's called that because it has a payload of 100 kilograms. Now, if you look at the two rectangular ro robots, um, there is the 500 on the right-hand side and the 1500. And again, their payload, as you would expect, is 500 kilogram and 1500 kilogram. So today we're gonna be spending more time on the big ro robots, as we affectionately call them, the 500 and the 1500, because these are the ARs that are capable of moving the type of loads that you would otherwise move with a pallet and a forklift. And um, all of those robots um, talk to the same cloud-based control center, um, FetchCore. So when you deploy this fleet, you essentially select the robots that are best suited to the task, and they all connect to a cloud-based control center, and that is where you do your deployment and your programming and all the other configuration tasks. So when it comes to forklifts, um, it is really the 500 and the 1500 um, that, that, that we sort of want to focus on. Now let's 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 take a look at forklifts um, and, and, and sort of how, how many times the situation is with forklifts in, in, in warehouse um, or, or, or related working, working environments. There's about 400 different manufacturers of forklifts. They're very, very prevalent. And what you're seeing here in the video, this near miss, and I watched now, um, this actually isn't as common as you may, as you may believe. Right? There's some 850,000 forklifts active in the US. So it is interesting for us to look at um, the accident statistics and see um, what sort of the, the, the unintended effects and the cost is of operating these forklifts um, in such a ubiquitous manner. Now in the United States, we can get this data from OSHA, right? And OSHA collects accident statistics. And if you look at that, then we can see there's almost um, 95,000 accidents a year. Right? So if we, if we hold that up next to the population of 850,000 forklifts in the United States, that means that a little more than 10% of forklifts are going to be involved in an accident every single year. So statistically speaking, in other words, if you are operating 10 forklifts in a warehouse environment, then the, the odds are you're going to have one incident per year. And not all of those incidents, as you can see, right? not, not many of them, thankfully, are fatal, but quite a number of them are causing serious injury. And um, uh, an even larger number of them um, is sort of non-serious forklift incidents, right? So there's a significant price involved, a significant cost in operating your, your processes with forklifts. And this is, of course, first and foremost, um, the, the sort of the danger to and, 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 and danger to human life and human health, but it's also a monetary cost, right? So the average cost of a single injury here is 150 so this is what's motivating us, and this is what's motivating our customers when um, when it comes to um, when it comes to sort of looking at alternatives to forklifts and AMRs, autonomous mobile robots, have increasingly sort of been playing a role here. Now, one thing forklifts do is is they move around um, pallets very effectively. Um, so when it comes to moving around pallet-sized loads, it's in, in the fetch portfolio, it's the Freight 500 and the, the Freight 1500 base. Um, what you see here on the left-hand side is the, the 1500. Um, now, it can pick up and drop off these loads, right? So the forklift loads and unloads um, these, these, um, these workloads automatically. To get to a similar type of functionality, um, we've developed two approaches with AMRs. One is to have the AMR move a cart. And this is what you see here in the middle. The 500 cart connect uh, allows the AMR to go underneath this orange base and pick up the base and then move it somewhere else. On top of that base, um, you can build a custom cart, right? So if you are moving a workload that can be moved by a big cart, and remember the payload here is 500 kilogram, then a cart connect solution may be a good fit. And again, this gives you similar behavior to what a forklift can do if it sort of goes and picks up a pallet and moves it somewhere else. So if, you have, if your load fits onto a card, the 500 card connect is a good choice. Now on the right hand side, you can see the 1500, the Freight 1500, also with a lift. 
Now that lift is also designed to go underneath the orange um, pickup and drop off station that you see here on the right hand side. And that pickup and drop off station, we call these also P and D stations. This is designed so that you can put a pallet on top, right? So the, the, the sort of the, the idea here is that the forklift puts the pallet on top of the P and D station, and then the robot um, gets notified, um, and the robot can come and pick up the pallet and move it to another P and D station. So this is how you can interface between a forklift and the robot. And that is how our customers are um, sort of gradually replacing their forklift driven processes um, with processes that are also supported by AMRs. So let's take a look at what kind of use cases um, are good candidates for considering an AMR for. We see these on the distribution side, on the fulfillment side, so in the supply chain space, and we see them in manufacturing type companies. I'm gonna go through a couple of examples to give you an idea of what current AMR customers are looking at. Um, this isn't an exhaustive list. Um, this is essentially just the highlights of um, use cases where we've seen the AMR either with a cart or with a pallet be a particularly good fit. So one straightforward example is cross docking. In cross docking, um, you essentially have um, a, a series of receiving docks you have a series of outbound docks and you're sorting a pallet loads. So a truck arrives, the pallets get unloaded and the unloading is typically done by a forklift operator, but then to move the pallets to the destination docks, um, some of our customers have started looking at AMRs for that purpose. So in that case, the pallet is loaded onto the AMR. The AMR knows because the operator tells it or because a central system like a warehouse management system orchestrates the flow the AMR knows where to go, and the AMR essentially goes to the destination location, and there's another forklift operator there that picks up the pallet and moves it into the truck. So where you used to have a forklifts going back and forth with a lot of forklift traffic, you essentially have forklifts now more focused on the dock areas and the AMRs doing the long runs. Another example here is a standard put away process, right? So in this process, you essentially have, again, a dock area where the loads arrive, and then those loads typically on pallets get moved into um, pallet storage. Um, again, the, um, I, you can either have the pallet as a whole, like we've seen in the cross docking example put on the robot, or you can have um, the, the sort of the, if it's floor stack boxes, you can have the boxes put on the robot, and then the robot goes um, again to one or more storage areas where the boxes get unloaded, and put into storage, right? So if 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 you if you're moving cases and if you're receiving your caseloads in a floor stacked trailer, um, that is a, a an alternative to putting these boxes on a pallet and moving the pallet to storage and then having the, the pallet be unloaded. So you're saving the step with the pallet. You're putting the boxes on the AMR, and the load and the unload um, happens by 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 the associates in the docking area and in the storage area. And again, the AMR um, through either a tablet application or through um, a scan gun integration, you can either tell the AMR manually the destination areas where you want the load to go, or you can have the flow be integrated with a um, warehouse management type system that will then direct the AMR to the right location. Um, a replenishment flow is another good example um, for um, a, a sort of a, a workflow that traditionally is done with pallets where customers are increasingly looking at AMRs. So in this example, the um, replenishment flow is, 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 is sort of bringing goods out of storage into some kind of supermarket or a line feeding area. Um, as you can see in the picture here, this is a Freight 500 moving a cart, except that it doesn't look like a cart here, it's just a cart base and then totes are stacked on top of the cart base. So in this example, the flow is essentially done using totes and the totes are stacked on the cart base. And again, either manually or through some kind of orchestration software, um, the robot gets sent to the, the sort of the, 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 right, the right area, be it, be it next to the manufacturing line or be it in a supermarket area. And that is where the totes get unloaded and typically end up on a flow rack. Um, and again, the orchestration can be done manually or it can be done through um, a scan gun or also through a voice system, right, where it's easy to add a command that triggers a robotic workflow. Now, the advantage that you're getting from using the cart base is that the robot doesn't have to wait to be unloaded, 
right? So in one of the previous examples, we've seen um, the boxes stacked directly on the robot. In this model here, the cart brings the same advantage as a pallet for a forklift in that you have a convenient unit of manipulation. And in this case, the robot would sort of go to the destination area. It would drop off the cart, lower the lift, and then the robot again would be able to go into other things while the cart base gets gradually unloaded and moved into either storage or onto a flow rack. Now, another use case that is very promising that we started working with several customers on is mixed case ballot building. So in this model, you have um, case loads in storage and you want to put together a pallet that has a combination of different cases. This is very frequently done in the retail supply chain where these pallets get put together for specific stores. So you have two cases of one SKU and then you have one, one case of another SKU and so on. And the pallet is custom built for a specific store before it goes again to a dock area onto a truck and then gets um, transported out to the store. So in this example, um, you have the robot essentially starting out with an empty pallet and then it goes through zones. And in every zone, there is a human picker that waits for the robot to arrive and then follows instructions, again, for example, through a voice system. And these instructions tell the picker what cases to put on the pallet. So in this case, you're sort of creating an automated flow where the human associates don't have to drive around with forklifts anymore. They're essentially just waiting in their zone. Um, the AMRs line up and they bring the um, partially built pallets and the human associate then puts one or two more boxes um, or however many cases onto the pallet and then the AMR proceeds to the next zone. If at some point there is a need to stretch wrap the pallet then the AMR would go to a stretch wrapper, you would sort of stretch wrap a layer and then the AMR would continue down um, sort of the run until the pallet is fully built to um, sort of have in an optimized fashion the customized set of boxes that need to be on that pallet. And again, this flow can be driven by some kind of optimization logic. There are several systems out there that optimize the build of a pallet, you know, heavy stuff at the bottom, stretch wrap, and so on. And so to build a, a sort of a, 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 the best and optimized um, pallet that has the best stability characteristics, you would want that kind of optimization software driving the sequence and uh, the structure of the layers on the pallet. Um, but again, in this example, you don't need a human forklift driver going from sort of one location to the next. The AMR does the traveling, and the humans, uh, the human associates essentially just wait and put the cases on top of the robot. Um, so that's a great example of how the AMR can help um, implement a very optimized flow and, um, you know, in a more, in a safer, more sort of, uh, in, 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 in an implementation that is less prone to create injuries, and that may give you, um, you know, better productivity overall as well, right? So several of our customers are looking at mixed case pallet building as one of the applications for these um, larger AMRs. Now, finally, we talked about um, replenishment and we talked about using the cart to move material um, to a manufacturing line. Um, there is a, a, another way to do line site delivery. If you're using flow racks, then you can put the flow rack right on top of the cart base. And that is what we're seeing in this example. This again is a Freight 500. It is loaded here with in orange our cart base. And on top of this cart base isn't a cart in the conventional sense, but is a flow rack. And so the idea here is that you have, um, you know, work going on using a manufacturing line, and you want these flow racks to be filled up in some kind of um, supermarket area. And then once they're full, the robot brings the flow rack back to the line site location where, um, you know, human associates work, at, you know, performing the manufacturing tasks that happens at the line and the robot would essentially bring a full, a full flow rack and then pick up an empty one and bring it back to the supermarket area. So if you have space for two flow racks um, and in most line side setups, that's the case, then the robot can make sure that there is always a full one at the line and the other one is at the supermarket where it gets refilled. And then the robot sort of brings the full one and then takes the one that has been um, sort of reduced in terms of inventory and takes it back to the supermarket so it can be refilled. And while this is going on, if there is enough uh, time in between runs, the robot can go and do other things because the cart allows the robot to connect and then go and do other tasks while, um, you know, people work on refilling um, totes on the, on, on the flow rack. So it's a beautiful example for 
how you can take a workflow that is traditionally done, you know, with a big heavy cart um, moved by a forklift and get it on top of an AMR. And then one last example that that many many customers frequently overlook, but um, that is sort of a really good application for an AMR, and that is to move uh, essentially recycling and garbage um, containers that are typically set up in sort of various locations in a, for example, manufacturing plant, where you know material gets used in cartons, the cartons get torn open once uh, the content of a carton is is consumed, it gets thrown into a recycling container, and once an hour. Um, a forklift comes, picks up the recycling container, moves it to sort of a, a, a place where it can get removed and picks up an empty container and brings it back. And it is exactly these kind of flows that are easy to automate with an AMR, um, such as the, the Freight 1500 that we're showing here. Um, a good way of doing this is either with a pallet on top of the robot or um, with a Gaylord, which is this big either cardboard or plastic box on top of, again, the cart base, which allows the robot to autonomously pick up and sort of move around uh, the box, right? So if you have your gate loads on top of a, a cart base, then it is it is very straightforward a workflow where the robot goes around and once an hour picks up sort of the full, um, the full gate load and brings it to the recycling um, location and then brings back an empty one. Or alternatively, if you don't want that flow running on a fixed schedule, you can get it to run on demand using, again, a voice integration, a barcode scanner, or some other triggering device, such as a tablet application. So this rounds up the, um, the, the examples um, of how our customers are using AMRs um, in, to sort of gradually replace the type of um, workflows that are traditionally being done with forklifts. Now, how, how is it that AMRs can be safer in, 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 in performing these workflows? So the answer lies in the sensor technology that we use in these in these modern AMRs. Now, as you as you can tell from this AMR here, um, there is um, a a sick sensor right here in the in the bottom right corner, right? So, one of the very commonly used sensing technologies is 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 laser scanners or lidars that allow us to measure distance. The other technology that you can see in this picture here is three D cameras, and those are in the four corners pointing. Um, you know, in pretty much at all, all, all around the AMR. So let's take a closer look at the sensor technology that we're using in these AMRs. Now, before we look at sensors, um, it is good to understand the kind of environment that um, the AMRs are moving in, right? It is, it is sometimes we hear about lights out warehouses, but many times there is a lot of activity in a warehouse. Um, and so this video here gives you, gives you sort of an idea how forklifts work together with humans, um, work together with other self-driving machines and have to work together with AMRs also. So when we talk about AMRs in a warehouse where forklifts are being used, it is important to keep in mind that you're not gonna be able to overnight replace every single forklift. So to be helpful, a space that's dominated by forklifts, the AMR needs to be able to work together with, collaboratively with forklifts and people. And there's a reason why these robots are called collaborative robots is because they have the sensor technology to do so. So let's take a closer look here. Um, this again is the robot that we saw two slides ago. Um, as you can see here in, in the annotations, um, you very nicely see the SICK laser scanner that we use on the robot. It is the MicroScan 3, and we're gonna hear, we're gonna hear more about um, the SICK LiDAR here. There is another one of these lidars on the diagonally opposite side of the robot. So you cannot see it from here. And that is done by design because together, those two laser scanners give us um, a 360 degree view. And then as we said before, there, is, um, eight, there are eight 3D cameras on this robot, which also from a 3D camera perspective, give us a 360 degree um, view. Now, the special thing about um, the SIG Microscan LiDAR here, this yellow safety rated model, is that it connects directly with um, the motor controller. So irrespective of the software functionality that we put on the robot using ROS and using um, our own software, the LiDAR is able to talk to the motor controller. And if it recognizes a moving obstacle, it's gonna slow down and eventually halt the robot, right? So that is the, the, the very fundamental safety subsystem that we're using here in the 1500 and the 500. And it's made out of the, the SICK uh, MicroScan 3, 
and the safety system that works together with the, the LiDAR to create that independent safety subsystem. And then we use the 3D ca cameras and other sensors and, um, and, and, and LED functionality to improve the behavior of um, the robot in, in these dynamic workspaces. So let's go ahead and um, take a closer look at uh, take a closer look at at the lidar, which is sort of the foundation here for the the safety. So the way a lidar works is it it is a device that is designed to measure the distance between the AMR and the environment. And the way this works is by emitting a bundled ray of light, a, a laser, um, that gets deflected by a rotating mirror, and that mirror rotates quite fast. And it does fifteen rotations a second, and by rotating, it deflects the LIDAR, it deflects the laser beam all through, uh, throughout the environment. So you essentially get a 360 degree um, perception of the environment 15 times a second. Now in the same LIDAR, you have a receptor that measures when the reflection of the laser beam comes back to the LIDAR. So by calculating the time, by knowing the time in between the emission and the reflection arriving, you can calculate the distance. And if you look at the animation on the right, um, this is how the LIDAR perceived the world. Now, there's very, for example, used on self-driving cars that um, create a 3D um, scan and that can tell you sort of three-dimensionally um, about the distance between the LIDAR and the environment. The LIDARs that we use on the AMR are planar. So they give you a 2D planar view of um, the environment around the robot, as you can see here in the right-hand um, animation. So to understand what exactly the LiDAR sees is you need to know how high it is mounted on the robot. We're using the Freight 100 robot here on the right-hand side. The LiDAR is about a foot off the ground. In the bigger Freight 500, Freight 1500 robots, the LiDAR is about half a foot um, from ground. So this is the plane. This is the level of perception that the laser scanner um, gives at the AMR. Let's take a look at these LiDARs in action. So again, this is a um, Freight 500. It has two of the SIG LIDARs. And I'm going to now hand it off to Alex, who's going to tell us more about um, the uh, Microscan 3. Thank you, Stefan. Uh, Stefan, you gave a really great overview of what a LIDAR scanner is and how it works. The object of these yellow safety rated LIDAR scanners, though, uh, is very simple, yet significantly more critical. It's to protect human life. Uh, the video that you're seeing shows how six Microscan 3 can withstand the presence of hot, bright sparks, as well as jolts of vibration, while still operating uninterrupted, and while performing its critical task of protecting human life in a harsh material handling environment. Fetch's vehicles are safe because they use six safety scanners. And our safety scanners date back about 20 years now. Our current product line, the Microscan 3 that Fetch uses, represents the culmination of everything the company has learned from thousands of customer applications in countless environments. These sensors are designed to operate in even the most difficult conditions, and you're probably already familiar with how loud, dirty, and sometimes unpredictable uh, a material handling environment can be. Uh, maybe if we go to the next slide, we can take a look at some uh, data quality examples. Now, it, it's worth noting how important data quality is to this task. Uh, with each new product family, SICK has refined the technology in its safety scanners to ensure that the scanner's environment is both precisely and accurately detected. Um, on the next slide, I think we'll see an illustration that shows the improvement in data quality uh, from our previous safety scanner family, the S300, that's on the left side. Uh, to the family that Fetch employs on its vehicles now, the Microscan 3. This is the data plot of a flat wall like you would find in any building. While both plots are fairly accurate, you'll notice that the Microscan 3 plot on the right is noticeably more flat and closer to the y-axis. This is the kind of improvement that makes six safety scanners and Fetch's vehicles the best and safest in their respective classes. So I, I would leave you with the thought that because they use six safety scanners, Fetch's vehicles have the most accurate perception of their surroundings, which makes them safe to be around people. Thank you, Alex. Now, now let's maybe take 
Let, let's maybe take a look at um, what what this LIDAR data looks like when when the AMR used to get around the workspace. So what we have here on the left hand side is a, a full color video of um, a scene. In this scene, one of our product marketing managers moves a pallet check um, from a sort of one spot to another spot. On the right hand side, you have the same scene time synced with the actual video, except that on the right hand side, what we're showing is just the LiDAR data. And in this example, we're using our small robot, the Freight 100. So the LiDAR is mounted at a foot height off the ground. And you'll, you'll, you'll probably observe that we've been, we've been making it easy for ourselves a little bit in that put um, these boxes on the pallet check. And that's a good thing because it is only because of these boxes that we can see the full length of the pallet check. If the tines are lower than a foot, then they're not visible to the LiDAR. In that case, the LiDAR is picking up the boxes, but you can see how the, the sort of the legs um, register on the LiDAR as, as David here walks um, from the first to the second one. So this is how the robot sees the world. And note also how the robot sees um, the, the walls and the other sort of static members of the environment here. So this is the, fundamentally, that's what the data looks like that we're getting from a LiDAR in, in, in the small robot. Now to get to a 360 degree field of view on the big robot, as you can see on the left-hand side here, um, we, need, we need two of these LiDARs, right? And they're mounted diagonally opposite in two corners on, on, on the... And because of that, the AMR actually really doesn't have a front or a back side, right? So it can move forward or backward and it has the same level of visibility. And this is really very powerful in those kind of busy environments that we're looking at. A forklift, for example, when it has a fully loaded pallet, um, it's it, the field of view of the driver is blocked. So many times forklift that are fully loaded will move backwards. This AMR, as an example here, doesn't differentiate between backward and forward because it has equally good sensor coverage on both sides. Now, the one drawback here of the planar LiDAR is that we really only see one plane, one slice of the world around us. And to get beyond that, we complement the LiDAR with um, 3D depth cameras. And those depth cameras, two of them are mounted in each one of the corners. So they create um, eight um, bubbles, if you want, shown here in blue, that are sort of strategically positioned around the AMR. So again, with those bubbles, we get 3D perception all around the robot. Right? And that is how the sensor coverage is optimized here on these, the 500 and the 1500 that have, um, you know, essentially identical sensor layout. So it's a combination of a 2D LiDAR um, and then uh, the 3D cameras. So now let's take a look at the 3D camera um, to sort of understand how the data we get from a 3D camera complements the um, data and the sensor, the sensor understanding that we're getting from um, the 2D lasers. So a 3D camera is essentially a um, stereoscopic camera where you use two different cameras to get two different images of the same scene. And then in the scene, you look for certain features that you can recognize, right? And that's an important thing to know here about 3D cameras is they are based on interpreting the data that we're getting from the camera. So this interpretation algorithms that process the data, um, these algorithms look for features that can be recognized in both images. And then based on seeing the difference in the location of these features and based on knowing the difference between the two cameras, we can easily calculate the distance of these features. Now, for that to work, um, there needs to be features in the scene. So what do we do if we have a 3D camera that's looking, for example, at a white wall? And to deal with that kind of situation, the 3D camera also has a, typically a textured light projector, right? So it essentially has a projector that projects a pattern onto the scene so that if you're looking at a white wall, um, the texture creates an artificial set of that we then can use to um, calculate the depth. Right? So in, in a way, the 3D camera works the same way that your eyes work. And, and the work that your brain does when it sort of sees the two images and reconciles them into a, a sort of a depth perception. The same work is happening in um, some optimized processing that's happening right on the camera that's attached to the camera. And to increase contrast, um, the camera comes with a texture projector. Now, typically, these stereoscopic cameras are black and white because we don't need um, color for that. Um, and also typically the 3D camera also has uh, an RGB color camera. 
So the video that you've seen on some of the previous slides of the pallet check scene, that was created with the RGB color camera. So that's how a 3D camera works. Now let's take a look at the kind of perception that we get from a 3D camera. What we've done here is we've, we're showing you a raw image um, of two different scenes, and then we're showing the uh, point cloud, the distance measurements that we're getting from the 3D camera um, converted to colors, right? So um, if, um, if, if, if an item is green, it's very near. As it gets sort of towards red and pink, it becomes further away, right? And this is how the 3D camera sees the world. And note how it can pick out the person in the bottom left and in the bottom right. Note how it picks out the forklift and uh, the tines of the forklift here in the top right. But also observe how, as you get further out, um, the depth perception goes away. So after a certain distance, it's four meter in, in, in this example here, and with the cameras that we're using, if you go much beyond four meters, then you lose the ability to differentiate depth and everything looks pink, right? So the, 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 the working range of a 3D camera is much smaller than that of a LiDAR, right? The working range of a LiDAR is around 25 meters. The working range of the 3D camera here is around four meters, right? So the 3D camera gives you full 3D depth perception, but at a lower range. And also with a process um, that, that uses algorithms and it gives you sometimes noisy results, right? So the kind of data that you're getting from a LiDAR and from a 3D camera is a little different. Now let's see how we can put those two sensor technologies together. In this example here, you can see the LiDAR as a sort of a green beam um, shooting out of the, the, the laser scanner in, mounted in the front of the robot. And it detects sort of the distance to the, the nearest obstacle, in that case, the legs and the forklift. Now it doesn't see the tines because the tines, as we said earlier, are below the mounting height of the LiDAR. Now to get to see the tines and to get to see um, things that are um, overhangs or higher, you know, higher, you know, above the height of the, the mounting um, height of the LiDAR, um, we use uh, two 3D cameras on a small robot. One is angled downward and the other one's angled upward. And by combining all the sensor data, we get a good understanding of the scene. And so that's why the sensor coverage of the robot is um, optimized for both the LiDARs and for the 3D cameras. So let's go back to um, the scene we had earlier where um, a pallet check gets pulled from one location to another. On the left hand, you see that same scene um, and again, you can see the LiDAR data in red, but you're also seeing the um, data coming from the downward facing 3D camera in green. And note how this gives you sort of a, a, the feet and the bottom of the forklift. So this would work even if the forklift wasn't loaded with boxes, we would be able to recognize the tines of the forklift close to the floor because of the downward camera. And note how on the right hand side, the upward angled camera then complements other pieces. So what you're seeing here is the parked forklift on the left hand side and the shelf on the right hand side. And note how by fusing the data, um, the lighter data, the downward, uh, downward uh, 3D camera data and the upward facing camera data, we get a fairly good picture of a person pulling a pallet check. So that is how the robot develops an understanding of the environment that it is in. Now, one more time here on the left side is all the sensor data aggregated. On the right hand side is the actual raw RGB video footage. And there's one additional uh, piece, one additional layer that we're showing here, which is the voxels. The voxels are a result of an analysis that we do on the sensor data, where essentially we create this Minecraft um, block based view of reality and we use that view to, to capture and track um, moving obstacles, right? So the only thing we know is that there is a dynamic object here in the scene. And by taking all the sensor data, fusing it and converting it to these voxels, we get sort of a Minecraft view, um, a view that's made out of blocks um, of where this obstacle is located and where it's moving, right? So this is the result of an, analytic, uh, an analytical process that we are doing on, on the fetch side in software. And it gives us a good understanding about moving obstacles um, in any kind of obstacle here in, in the workspace of the robot. And again, on the right hand side, the actual video footage um, for, for comparison. So let's take a look at how we can use the sensor data to discover obstacles that are on the ground. Right? And this is a real life example. 
On the right-hand side, you again have the raw footage. Um, if you maybe, so look at this on the right-hand side um, first, um, it'll start over in a second here, but this Freight 100 is moving down an aisle and there is the ballot check with the tines on the floor. Right? If we only rely on the LiDAR, then we may not see the tines. It depends on what height the LiDAR is mounted on the robot. But because of the fact that we're using the um, downward facing 3D camera, the green point cloud data, and now watch it going up to the tines and then watch how the data pops up. And now it recognizes the tines on the floor here. And the purple is sort of a safety inflation on top of the green um, 3D, uh, 3D camera data. And that is how the robot recognizes there's an obstacle on the floor and it dynamically adjusts its path. Let's kind of take a look at how we use the same approach here to detect an overhang. So this could be a forklift with the tines raised, or it could be a um, piece of uh, sort of a cardboard box that's sticking out of a, a rack. So in our example here, we've got the cardboard box. It's a little hard to see, but if you look now on the right-hand side, that was the box. And if you look, um, we'll play it one more time, but if you look on the left-hand side, as soon as the robot comes up to the overhanging box, um, the kind of blue data gives us an indication there it is, and the robot sort of deviates to the left. So for that to work, the robot needs to know how high it is, and that's indeed the case. The robot has a notion of both its footprint and its height, and that combined with the data from the upward facing 3D camera allows us to detect an overhang and safely move around a workspace where, for example, you may have a pallet check with the tines on the, on the ground or a forklift with the tines raised or some box sticking out of a a rack, which is, which is a very frequent occurrence in a sort of a typical warehouse environment. So there's different approaches in the AMR community. Um, some AMRs have uh, on, on, on sort of their bigger robots, they have the, the, the sense of pointing primarily forward and backward and um, sort of a little bit of a, a blind spot on the left and on the right side. Um, and the logic there is, well, the AMR can move forward or backward, um, but it cannot move sideways. Some this is true for most of the AMRs that are out there. Um, so there may not be considered a need for 360 degree sensor coverage. We do not subscribe to that school of thought on the fetch side. So our laser scanners give us a 360 degree um, field of view, and that gets complemented by the 3D cameras, as we said, eight of them on the big robots that also give us a 360 degree um, all around field of view. And that allows us to maneuver with confidence and with speed and precision, even um, if we're moving heavy load. One maneuver where this is particularly useful is when you have to make a turn. Um, so if you have to make a turn and you don't have all around sensor coverage, you essentially have to come to a stop. Then you turn and then you move again. Um, if you have all around sensor coverage, then you can make a very smooth and efficient turn. And at the same time, you can move quickly and confidently because you have sensor coverage all the time in all directions. So you're going to see a dynamic obstacle move closer and you're going to be able to replan um, as you're moving along. Another example of where the um, sensor technology is useful when it comes to interacting with objects in the environment. So in this example here, we're showing how the, 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 the AMR with its um, laser scanners uses the laser scanner to recognize the PND station. So the way this works is that the PND station has fiducials, markers, built into the structure that are mounted at the height of the LiDAR. And in the incoming LiDAR data, um, we recognize these patterns and we can use them to calculate our precise position. And by doing that, we can do a docking maneuver. Um, in this example, we do, we're docking with the PND station. We're getting ready to pick up a pallet but we're using the same approach to um, have a, a, a robot pick up a cart or to have a robot find and connect with a charging station. And another observation here is the sort of the properties of the, the SIG laser scanner um, primarily is, is sort of the, the safety subsystem that Alex talked about, but the data is available not only to the safety subsystem, but also to our software on the robot for analysis. And that is how we are in sort of a secondary way here using that LiDAR data to recognize the objects in the environment we care about and not only recognize them, but also detect their position and orientation. And that allows us to implement docking and pickup and unload maneuvers. The idea behind this PND station, as we said earlier, is that it gets loaded by a forklift and then the robot autonomously finds the station, connects with 
um, the pallet that is loaded and then can essentially take over the pallet and bring it somewhere else. So this is an example for how the same laser scanner, how the same sensor setup that we talked about for um, recognizing obstacles and for getting around the environment is also used to localize, detect the position of objects in the workspace that we care about, like the PND station in this example. So if we now put all this together, um, the LiDAR data, the um, two cameras in that example, um, and we're using it not only to um, detect objects and to um, find um, obstacles, but also for our navigation, this kind of gives you the full um, view of how the AMR sees the world. So what you're seeing here as before is the red data is the LiDAR, the blue and green is the 3D cameras, the voxels are sort of the structures that we're recognizing, and the red arrows on the ground is the path that the robot has globally planned, but is dynamically adjusting as it understands and learns about the environment. And in this case right now, it sees an obstacle and it's adjusting the path on the fly to navigate around the obstacle and reach its destination, right? So the, the path that the robot follows is informed by um, the obstacles that we detect using the sensor data from the laser scanner and the 3D cameras. And this data is something that we are collecting over time that we can analyze. And it is actually a treasure trove um, because it allows us to, by analyzing it, recognize other things that are interesting in the environment. We can, for example, get a better understanding of traffic patterns or congestion. We can recognize certain types of materials. So for example, if you have a pallet on the floor somewhere, we can recognize by analyzing the same, oh, this is a pallet. And we may not do so right there on the flight, but we can do so after, you know, after the MR has gone by. You know, this doesn't have to happen immediately for it to be useful. Or we can recognize where people are. We can recognize where people are that are close to forklifts. And we can maybe flag that as a safety situation where if we could improve the traffic, the rules of the road, the traffic management in the work environment, we could maybe make the environment safer, right? So there is a whole, um, list of um, things that can be done with that data in order to improve operational efficiency and in order to improve safety and um, create and analyze records of what uh, is going on in the work environment of the robot. And those are very exciting topics um, that we're going to talk about maybe in another webinar. So that is just a teaser. So with that, I think Alex and I are going to wrap it up and we are ready to maybe answer some questions. Yeah, thank you, Stefan. Let's see, we have a few questions. The first question is, is do AMRs work directly through my warehouse management system or do I need additional software? No, so you do not need additional software. The, the, the AMRs in our case come with a um, cloud-based management software and using that software, which you get out of the box. Um, and since it run, runs in the cloud, there isn't any overhead involved in setting it up and deploying it using that software, you can define and start workflows on these AMRs. So as long as you have a way to trigger a workflow, which could be any device that you already have um, on the floor, such as a barcode scanner or um, you know, a voice, um, a voice directed system, um, or just a tablet application or a simple connected button, you can use any of these means to trigger workflows of the AMRs without having to integrate them with your warehouse management software. Now that said, many of our customers do choose to integrate and it's not hard, it is a, a REST-based service interface where again, the warehouse management software then triggers workflows and at the workflow level, you, you essentially tell the robots what you want them to do. So you can go either way. Many times customers start with um, a sort of a, a more operator-driven approach and then eventually they integrate and they have the warehouse management system trigger the workflows directly. Great. The next question is, is what is the weight limit for freight 500 and 1500? The, the, the weight limit is, is, is 500 kilogram for the 500 and 1500 kilograms. So one and a half metric tons for the 1500. Okay. Um, why use LiDAR if there's already 3D cameras all over the AMRs? The, the, the two types of sensors, the 3D cameras and the LiDAR um, have very complementing characteristics, right? The, the 3D camera gives you a good 3D view, um, but its working range is about four meters. Um, and it's also subject to more noise 
because at the end of the day, you're running computer vision algorithms on the data and you're looking for features. So this gives us really good results, but it isn't, it isn't sort of um, perfect. The LiDAR um, gives you much crisper data. It has a longer working range, so you can see further out. And it's not subject to um, effects like reflections on the floor um, or, or, or sort of certain light patterns that may confuse the 3D camera. So for safety purposes, the LiDAR with its better range and with its um, clearer, precise, more precise data is um, the best choice. To complement that, the camera is a good option. It's inexpensive and um, it gives you better coverage um, up in that. The next question is, how can you use the safety features of the six safety LiDARs to your robot navigation stack? For example, are you slowing down when an object is detected or you come into a complete stop? That's an excellent question, right? So this is actually what the safety subsystem, um, that, that, that sort of connection between the LiDAR and the motor controller that's subject to a very tight and very sort of um, strict um, control layer, um, that is exactly what it does, right? So you're looking for obstacles. If an obstacle gets too close, then you're going to slow down the robot. And at some point, when the obstacle is too close, you're going to bring it to a stop, right? So the answer is both to your question, Lisa, in that when the robot is um, sort of further away and depending on its speed, it may decide to only reduce its speed. As the obstacle keeps coming closer, eventually the robot is going to come to um, a full stop. So if a forklift is just going by, then the robot may slow down and then accelerate again. If an obstacle is heading towards the robot, then the robot is going to slow down and eventually it's going to come to a full stop. Awesome. Stefan, the last question I have today is, how does the cloud fit in? Does a robot require network connection outside the building? Uh, another excellent question. So the, the responsibilities are split between the cloud and the robot. The cloud does the higher level planning. It um, shares with all robots an understanding of the environment and understanding of the tasks. So there's value in having that, that sort of central instance of knowledge where essentially there lives a model of the workspace and the model of what all the robots are doing and the activity and some of the traffic patterns. But there's local decision making also on the robot. And we've actually seen that nicely in the video. Um, where we've seen um, that the last video that we've seen, where we've seen the global path with the red arrows. And then as the robot with its sensors detects an obstacle, it does it locally replans to move around the obstacle. So it's like it's if you want a partnership between the logic that runs on the robot that we use for time critical um, decision making, like avoiding an obstacle and having the centralized um, sort of planning and coordination logic in the cloud. And there's advantages in using the cloud, which namely are that it's very easy to deploy that software. Um, you have the processing power of the cloud. You have the ability to manage large amounts of data, to look for patterns in that data. So there's many things that sort of happen more naturally and much easier in the cloud. Um, and you get the really nice uh, deployment characteristics that you're familiar with from any cloud service that you essentially just subscribe to and it works. Thanks again, Alex and Stefan. That's all we have time for today. And we hope to see our listeners again soon. Please visit sick.com to stay in the know on our upcoming webinars and um, have a great day. Thanks again, you guys. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you.